another podcast from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be a great podcast today. Before we get into it, I want to shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit company. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Everyone you know knows somebody that has gone over into the military and has had a difficult time transitioning back into normal society. It's a difficult prospect because you lose brotherhood, you lose structure, you lose a lot of things that you're accustomed to. And VetLife is there to make this transition easier. They're there to help you get the benefits that you need. They're there to help you have a simpler process finding community and the things that you need to transition back to a normal life. If you would like to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram, through Facebook, or go to their website at vetlifetoday.org. I'm going to introduce John Ryder. He is the executive director for the Michigan Heroes Museum, and uh, he's going to have a great story today and, and great stories from some of the people that are featured in the museum. So without further ado, uh, John, for the people that don't know you, just tell us a little bit about your background. You know, were you born and raised here in Michigan? And let's let's build your story. Sure thing. I was I was. Uh, born and raised in Hemlock, Michigan, up uh, about a half an hour, hour west of Saginaw, and uh, small community, small town values. And uh, when I was growing up, I always wanted to serve. You know, my mother always uh, threatened me with military school, and so I got looking into it. And I got excited about that, but she never pulled the trigger. Uh, I never ended up in the military, though. I've, I have epilepsy, and, and I wasn't allowed to to serve our country, and that capacity. However, what I'm doing now really excites me because it allows me to give back to those people who, who did serve our country and allows me to serve them by telling their stories um, at the Michigan Heroes Museum. We have over 850 stories of Michigan veterans, some who uh, survived their conflict, some who didn't. Uh, we also tell the story of Mich the stories of Michigan's astronauts as well because most of those uh, 15 of the 17 had military careers also. So we, we just tell a lot of really amazing stories about some fantastic people, and I'm excited to share some of those today. How did you get started with the Michigan Heroes Museum, and how long have you been with them? So I've been with the, mu uh, with the museum nearly seven years. I got started because um, I was looking uh, to transition jobs, and uh, one of the, I was a Cub Master at the time, one of my den leaders, I came up to me and said, hey, I'm on the board of this museum. Are you interested? I said, are you kidding me? I didn't even know the museum still existed. They moved um, uh, from one place in Frankenmuth back in the 80s to another, and I, I lost them. I didn't know that they still existed. And so I was super excited to go and uh, have an opportunity to work at the museum and try to grow the museum. Where's the museum located now in so, Frankenmuth? Yep, it's, so it's, it's kind of behind... Um, uh, just north of uh, the Bronners, uh, you know, everybody knows, everybody Bronners, knows Bronners, right? So if you're coming up Main Street there into Bronners from Birch Run, it's uh, just south of Bronners. There's a, a kind of a Y split, and, and you can take a right and go up along the Silent Night Chapel and alongside of Bronners uh, on Y Street, and we're located just north of Bronners on Y Street. So this podcast got set up today by Josh Parrish. He's the gentleman that owns and operates Vet Life. Uh, how did you meet Josh? Like, what is the background connection there? So Josh is one of our board of directors now. And but before that, he's he, we both share a passion for veterans and veteran service is and and we had a lot of the same um, friends and and a lot of the same contacts and and uh, Josh is just a great guy. Vet Life what they do for people is amazing so does the museum have a website for the people that were you know that start to listen to this podcast before we even get into the stories that people can do some of their research and maybe plan a trip to this event you bet so um the the museum's website is m i heroes h e r o e s dot org and then uh, you can find us on facebook by just looking up the michigan heroes museum so now the part that I'm most excited about, you've got probably some unbelievable stories. You said over 850 veterans that have served from Michigan, um, you know, that went to war, fought for us. Let's get into some of those. Out of all the stories you probably know, 
let's go over maybe some that are the most impactful or the most inspiring, the ones that people, you know, would really want to hear or that would lead them to go see the museum. Sure. Person. So at, at the museum, we walk people through, we've got a couple of civil war so stories, but mainly we've got stories from the Spanish American war, world war one, world war two, Korea, Vietnam, operation desert storm, um, operation enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom, uh, you know, in, in OEF and, and uh, Afghanistan as well. Um, and then we've got our current war on terror stories and our astronauts from the state of Michigan. When How had, in the world can you pick from that type of Right, plethora? exactly. That's amazing. I, I didn't realize the timeline was so big. Exactly. And then, and then we've got two amazing galleries on top of those. One's our cross gallery. The cross is the, the second highest decoration that can be rece received for valor, bravery, gallantry. And it's the highest decoration that can be given out by the individual branches of service. So for the Army, it's a Distinguished uh, Service Cross. For the Navy and, and Marines, it'd be the Navy Cross, and then the Air Force Cross as well. Those stories in there are second to none. Um, the, the stories themselves. The highest decoration, the Medal of Honor, it goes through an additional vetting process and the, the recipients of that are nominated by Congress and it's presented to uh, them by the President of the United States. And uh, we've got at the museum the world's largest collection of name medals of honor on, uh, on display at our museum. And, it's just an amazing story, and, and eventually here during this podcast, I'm looking forward to telling you how we got that collection. Yeah, that's incredible. The Medal of Honor is something that culturally we all, I feel like, should know. When you hear Medal of Honor, you know that is like the most prestigious. You know that someone did something beyond incredible, like heroic, you know, movie iconic level of, of you know, a figure. Do you want to go into some of those stories now or like tell me what is the most impactful story out of all the ones that you probably know you're there on a regular basis you see people light up hearing these you know things which story resonates with you so i've got a a, a canned answer for when people ask me what my favorite story is and that is the last story i put out because we rotate these stories through we only have about 150 160 on display at any time so the museum, um, we rotate those through, especially when a family calls up and says, hey, can you get grandma's stuff out or Uncle Joe's stuff out? We'll make sure we get that out for them. Uh, so when they come in, it's their memories too, right? And so we want to make sure we do that. And we end up rotating our museum, about a half of the museum, uh, about every thir uh, three months. So, uh, but as far as my favorite stories, there are some that are more impactful you know stories but they're all amazing stories um the uh, we've got the most highly decorated enlisted airman ever from flint michigan his name's Dwayne hagney this guy here was a conscientious objector during vietnam but instead of running away from his obligations as soon as he graduated he enlisted in the air force <clears throat> and uh in in when he signed up with his recruiter, he said, I want to be a pararescue specialist. Those guys are the, the, the amazing guys that go in and recover downed airmen, right? And his, his, uh, his recruiter told him that in order to do that, you've got to graduate number one in your flight in, in basic training. And then you also got to uh, go through the school. And so he did that. He graduated number one in his flight. He ends up being able to select his his uh, job. And when he does that, uh, he goes through um, uh, jungle warfare training. He goes through uh, water uh, survival training. He does all these uh, uh, courses before he does his paramedic course. And then he does the paramedic course. And uh, he said that was the toughest one of them all because not only did he have to learn to give CPR, he had to live, learn to give CPR dangling from the gymnasium because maybe he's hanging for, out of a helicopter at the time. Um, he has, has to be able to give uh, CPR in the pool, you know, hold somebody up and give CPR while he's, he's in the pool and everything. He graduates number one from that class too. They allow him to... Um, decide what he wants to do 
uh, or where he wants to go, right? So he can select anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world for a base. And he ends up uh, selecting Vietnam, the most dangerous, because he feels like he can be the most useful there as a, as a pararescue specialist. As he's there, he's on a Jolly Green Giant. And he does over 200 missions on these Jolly Green Giants. And, and he goes out and they lower him into the jungle by this cable as they're hovering above. And he can't even necessarily see the ground. You know, the canopy is that thick. And he's got to go find his uh, the, the pilot or air crew. And he's got to bring him back and get him on that chopper safely. And um, as he, he, as they called the, the Jolly, right, the Jolly Green Giant, and so he's um, he's doing that, and um, he rescues over forty American aviators in that span of over two hundred missions, and uh, he was also left behind eleven times because when that Jolly Green Giant came under ground fire, they were ordered to get the heck out of there. It's uh, it was millions of dollars worth of equipment and. Uh, quite a few more lives on board that so they were ordered to get out of there so he, 11 times he had to find himself his own way to a um, uh, another place where they could pick him up another landing zone or uh, a friendly unit and that's just amazing and remember when I said he was a conscientious objector the first few times he didn't even carry a sidearm and then after that he said you know what maybe you can't give me a sidearm so it's it just a, an amazing guy doing amazing things. And, and when people think about the military uh, and, and heroes, most of them are thinking of the guys that are going in, guns blazing, everything. This guy was a hero without even wanting to carry a weapon. He said the only time he just charged his weapon was in the air to delay the, the pursuing forces just long enough for him to get away. Wow, that is incredible. 11 times he was left in hostile territory to fend for himself while he's just trying to save the lives of other people. Exactly. That's incredible. That's a reality that so few people, even hearing the story, you cannot grasp what that is like to have the mind that that gentleman had and the just dedication to a cause. You know what I mean? He's, he knew his job, he knew his purpose, and he was going to do it to the fullest of his capabilities. That is unbelievable. Exactly. And, you know, he, he, anybody that's seen the show Hacksaw Ridge and that gentleman, Desmond Doss, that was in that, um, he's, uh, he's a hero on so many levels, um, but he was also a conscientious objector, right? He didn't believe in taking lives and, and, and he was a Mennonite and um, it was something that he didn't believe in but he was willing to go over and save these guys. And through his training and everything, he got so much sl uh, slack because uh, these guys said, you're not gonna have our back until they saw him in action uh, overnight, lowering down dozens of bodies to, to save them off that ridge. And, and it's a similar story where um, these guys, though their conscience wouldn't allow them to take a life, their conscience drove them to save lives. So it's just a really cool story. That really is incredible. I mean, they put themselves at risk of losing their life, you know, an extremely high risk of doing so just in order to save the lives of their fellow human beings. You know what I mean? The people that are in this conflict, they're going in there and doing everything they can to save their life. That's a wild decision. Exactly. Now, what medal did that gentleman receive? That you so just told me he received the Air Force Cross. He's the most highly decorated enlisted man ever, uh, air, uh, enlisted airman ever. And um, in, in words, uh, I'm going to quote him directly. He said, I had the best job in, say, in Vietnam, saving lives. It, you know, it says it's crazy, but it's true. He's just a special human being. And he, is he still alive to this day? Or? No, he passed away at age 46. He had a, a congenital heart uh, defect, you know, since birth. The, it didn't appear right away. His, his father later in life uh, um, couldn't walk very far, you know, before he sat down and everything. So, um, unfortunately, his uh, ticker gave out. But what an amazing man, an amazing le legacy. And the, the people that he saved... You know, in the lives that they were able to lead, um, none of that would have happened without him.
No, the amount of people that appreciate that man is, is incredible and appreciate way more than like, hey, you're a friend. I appreciate you. you. He saved people's lives in one of the most difficult times in human history, Vietnam. You know, um, what I would say is he's the most decorated airman ever, you said, right? Yep. Ever. And he's from Michigan. Exactly. So all the stories we have in the museum are Michigan based. So either these individuals were born and raised in Michigan or maybe moved here after their service. Maybe these. Um, uh, served at a base here in Michigan. But Michigan was part of their story. Yep, you bet. And and uh, they're just each one of these stories. It, absolutely that, that's amazing. what's incredible. I mean, out of anywhere he could have been in the world, the most decorated airman in U.S. history, that incredible story that you just told me about, had Michigan as a part of a story. That is something that you'd want to see. Now, when you go to the museum and you see his story, what all stuff do you have there? Is it just literally the story? Do What, you know, articles from him or things do we have on display? So in, in each of our cases, we generally have a uniform and um, maybe headgear, maybe uh, their story. We definitely have a display of the medals that they received, uh, some photos of them, and then articles that were important to them and or their family to have displayed in, in that case. So um, every uh, case that we have is a four foot by four foot um, display case, a two foot deep. So we don't have a lot of room to get a lot of things in there, but enough to give people an idea of the of the flavor of who that person was during their military service. So they're, they're just really cool stories. No, a thousand percent. I'm sitting here with you today and that story just fired me up because I'm, I'm envisioning that human being. I'm thinking about what it was like to be that guy and what he was willing to sacrifice just to try to save human lives. Like you said, he's a conscientious objector. He's like, I'm not going to shoot somebody. I don't want to take someone else's life, but I'm going to go into the most hostile environment possible, drop down into a canopy where I can't see the ground and you might have to leave me, but I'm going to be there to save the people that are in the same unit as me or the same service. And that's incredible. That is well said. That's 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 the 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 core of it right there. So um, before we, because I want to hear a couple more stories, but before we go to that, how would you summarize the Michigan Heroes Museum in a way? Like if you had to give a pitch, if I said, hey, give a quick pitch, why everyone that's in Michigan should at some point visit this museum to understand this history and these stories. Give me a quick pitch on that. So whether you're a military enthusiast or not, if you're just a lover of freedom, you need to come here and see what your freedom cost, right? What what prices were paid for your freedom, for your liberty? Um, and uh, at the museum, you'll find that we look to honor, respect, and remember our nation's servicemen and women and our astronauts from the state of Michigan in a way that is just, it's just reverent. We, we absolutely love them uh, and uh, no amount of political correctness uh, matters at the at the at our museum. We just want to make sure that our veterans know that they're loved and appreciated, and it's a place where we can we can do that. And what is your role as executive director? Like, what is a daily you know a day look like for you? A week look like for you? A month? What what is your role within the museum? So I we've got two employees there and and some volunteers that that help out uh, and run the day to day. Um, uh, operations. My job is to seek funding for the museum for the continuing um, operations of the museum. We don't receive any federal or state money so everything is is uh, either uh, um, uh, individual donations largely and, and some uh, working with companies and things like that but we, we don't receive any or much outside funding at all. It's It's all individuals that say hey this is worth it to keep these stories out there and, and educate our our our, uh, um, our communities about these individuals. And uh, so my day is a lot of uh, fundraising, um, telling the stories, um, giving tours, things like that. That um, I don't know that there ever has been a typical day at the museum, um, but I absolutely love it because. Um, I, I love these stories and I love the people that I get to meet uh, through the museum and uh, some of the things I get to do. I, uh, I got to go to the White House with uh, the most recent Medal of Honor recipient from the state of Michigan, James McLuhan. Um, he, when he received the medal, he invited me to come to the White House with him and it was a fantastic opportunity and I wouldn't have had that opportunity if it weren't for the museum. But this is a guy 
who uh, was a medic in Vietnam and and just uh, saved people even after he was ordered to get down the chopper because he was hurt himself. He says, I can't leave these guys behind because they wouldn't have a medic. So he stayed and uh, he's just uh, an incredible individual and, and we're, the museum's just full of those type of people. If someone wanted to support this cause, I mean, because you've only told me one story and I already am inspired by it. It's just, it's amazing to hear feats of like mental strength and just conviction like this. It's incredible. But if someone wanted to donate to the museum, support the museum, hold a fundraiser for you, you know, how can they contact you or what's the best route to do so? So probably going on to our Facebook page and, and uh, sending us messages is, is probably the most direct route, the way that I'll get it the quickest. Um, but other than that, if you call the museum, you'll find the the information on the website or you go to the website and, and send us a message we'll, we'll find it and we'll get it and uh, we uh, will work with you to figure out um, how it is that you can help the museum um, we, we do have a place on the website where you can uh, put a donation in also but um, give us a call and and uh, let us know how you want us to use that donation too we um, we want to make sure that uh, um, we're fiscally responsible with our donations and, and that we're, we're using those in the, in the way that they're intended to be used. Uh, you know, every time we get a new story in, it costs the museum somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred dollars to, to get that display up and running. And, uh, but they're all such great stories. How, how can't we figure a way to get that done, right? So, 100%. You're incredibly hands-on. I can tell you want to be directly involved. You want the people that are a part of it to be directly involved. You want to bring in guests from the outside and have them, you know, captivated by these stories and inspired and hopefully passing them on to other people. So you're a very hands-on company. So, you know, it would feel good to donate to something like that, to know that you're not just sending a check off, you know, into the sunset and saying, hopefully they use that to continue this growth. You know, you came down here today to sit with me, to tell these stories, to talk about the museum, to, you know, just spread this, this incredible life of different human beings. Exactly. Let's talk about some, like maybe a couple other of the like Medal of Honors, because when you first said Medal of Honor, I know it from the, I mean, there's a popular video game called Call of Duty that everybody plays. All the young kids play this game called Call of Duty. Right. And, and Medal of Honor is and something. Battlefield 1. Yes. All these things, right? Like, Medal of Honor is scattered throughout that. The, the terminology, Medal of Honor. Yeah. Um, but it's the highest, most prestigious award that you can ever receive. Let's talk about one or two of the Medal of Honor stories that you have here at the museum. Exactly. So the, the museum, um, we've got um, 27 stories, or 27 actual medals, I should say. We've got more stories than just that. Um, and uh, before I tell you how we got those and what we do there since you, you mentioned uh, a couple of, um, of stories we've got uh, um, the stories of Oscar Johnson who was known as the um, Sergeant Yorker World War II you know they were in Italy in the foothills of Italy and um, his his company was engaged with five full companies of crack German paratroopers and uh, his squadron probably 12 or 13 uh, uh, strong in the squad was ordered to take a hill to their flank and keep them from getting outflanked. Um, in opposition to them was one full company of those German paratroopers. And uh, in taking that hill, all of his buddies passed away. They all died there taking that hill, leaving him to keep the hill. And he kept that hill for two days. He jumped from body to body of his buddies using their weapons. And, and he took out 20 German paratroopers by himself. Over the, these next two days, he had uh, guys um, try to come up and relieve him, but they were either beaten back, injured, or, or just couldn't get to him or killed themselves. And after two days of fighting, the 25 German paratroopers that were left in that company all surrendered to that one man. They didn't realize it was just one guy up there uh, doing all that you know, damage to their unit. It just amazing um, story of, of uh, uh, just service and, and get it done, right, at all costs. And, and he was his own backup. He, he didn't have anybody else to rely on, and he just got it done. And you can imagine the surprise of those 25 guys that <laughs> surrendered when they realized there's just one guy there. 
Oh my God. It's, it's hard to wrap my brain around that story because I'm like, okay, they surrender. It's one guy. They recognize there's 25. Just attack him. Right. You're, you're going to win. Yeah. Okay. But he might shoot a couple of you, but like you have 25 men. He is one person. Yep. It, that's, that's just such a mind blowing story. And like you said, a story of resilience that just the absolute refusal to quit despite all odds. Yeah. Doesn't matter what odds are stacked against that gentleman. He is not going to back down until he's a, you know, accomplished the mission or until he lost his life in the pursuit of the mission. So now that story comes back to America, right? And then it, it gets spread through the ranks and somehow gets to, you know, the people that can pull the right strings. What is the process for earning a Medal of Honor? Like, how did he actually then receive the Medal of Honor for this? So a, a Medal of Honor basically um, is channeled through a congressperson, a senator or congressman, um, and they go to the Defense Department. The Defense Department looks into it, investigates, um, look, tries to look up uh, if, if uh, you know, details on the story and everything. There's, there's quite a few boxes that need to be checked but it's not one of those things where you can go and say okay um for a medal of honor i need to do this 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 and this and so i'm going to go do that right that like in cub scouts or, or brownies or whatever you know what you need to do to earn that next award it's not like that it's just something that you know when you see it right and you or when you hear about it and um so that's the reason why it's it's so difficult to get these men and women to stand up and and want to even be recognized for what they've done you know and um we at the museum we're we've been having difficulties trying to get Viet, you know stories from vietnam until just recently uh, you know after 50 years these men and women still think that well i didn't really do anything over there and i'm telling you what they sure did and it's a, the each one of these people that i talk to have amazing stories and they say i didn't do anything right and uh the people from the war on terror and in afghanistan and iraq they think well, i didn't do anything the stories you have here are the ones that you know those those are pretty amazing and i get talking to them and they're absolutely amazing stories that that they have those personal stories so i you know any serviceman or a woman i don't care if you're a clerk typist or or a, a cook or whatever if you did your duty and you did it honorably um you belong in our museum so you would encourage people to reach out and, and speak to you about their service because like i mean i'm thinking right off the top of my head my grandfather through marriage uh, was a paratrooper in vietnam and i've never really sat down with him and really heard him talk about it. i know he was in vietnam i know he was a paratrooper i see at his cabin he's got like a couple of medals and things up on the walls and a couple old pictures of him you know in the best shape of his life and i i've known that he was a paratrooper but i never really asked him like hey tell me some stories from vietnam you know and uh just sitting here with you today i'm almost smacking myself like why have i never sat down with grandpa chip and said hey Tell me about your service. Tell me about the time that you spent over there. So a couple of things could happen there. Either either he's going to say, well, you never asked, and that's the reason why, because I've heard that come uh, back before, because a lot of times when people come to the museum, um, the veterans will tell us about their service and their their wives, their their kids, the you know friends or whatever, just had never heard these stories before, and uh, they're pretty – you know, amazed that, you know, they're going to tell us these stories and they've never heard them. Well, guess what? These individuals, they don't want their wives and their, their sons and daughters and friends to think of them having to do what they had to do. Right. So a lot of times, um, those stories are stories that are, are locked up either forever in, in their heart or maybe shared with the counselor at the VA or maybe shared at the VFW or American Legion hall. But a lot of them aren't interested in, in uh, uh, sharing those stories with families and loved ones. So it can be sensitive, but um, you know, those are the type of things that Josh at Vet Life helps, helps people work through and everything. Um, and uh, it, it, the museum is just a great way to open those stories up and get, you know, find out those stories because most people don't have a, a problem sharing us those stories. They know that we're not gonna judge them based on what anything they tell us 
Yeah, and I mean, you could almost run into a phenomenal network. You might meet other people in that community that are there for the same purpose. You know what I mean? They appreciate and they value the information that's in front of them. So you might end up making a great new friend or a great new connection, or it might get you to open up about your story when you're looking around and you're completely surrounded of, you know, in the ambience of all these incredible different journeys at different parts of this timeline of the world. And it might make you want to go, you know what? I am going to tell my story before my time here is up. You know, I'm a, like I said, I'm going to actually reach out to my grandpa now and ask him if he'll come on a podcast and say, you know what, tell me some of your Vietnam stories if he's interested, but I won't push the issue because I know for some people it is sensitive. You probably have to do things in moments like that, that a normal human being that has never gone and served wouldn't even comprehend what might have to take place in the name of getting a job done or accomplishing it. You, you know, bet. Goal. One of the things I would suggest is, is approaching your grandpa, ask him to come to the museum and and see some of the stories that we have and open the dialogue that way right and 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 uh, where he might not be comfortable at first sharing some of those stories once he hears you know some of the other stories and that people are willing to share may, maybe he changes his mind i don't know so. i also i had a great grandfather elmer weston who was in the doomsday invasion the d-day invasion of normandy he was one of the people that stormed the beach and i remember when i was super little he would only very very lightly talk about it and i grew up and uh he passed away probably about 10 years ago but i remember still on a regular basis at least a couple times a year i regret when i became an adult not asking my great grandfather elmer weston like, tell me what was D-Day like? Because we all know that is such a historic moment. You know what I mean? When we flooded the beach at Normandy and had to, you know, it's just an incredible loss of human life or basically launched a magnitude of pawns to say like, well, some of you will make it and complete the objective. That's a that's an incredible moment in, in history. And I still regret not pulling that story out of him to, you know, just as a lasting memory. There's something nostalgic about someone that did something on a level of, uh, heroism that you just don't see. You don't see these things in normal civilian life usually. So you guys almost are like a secret recipe in the way of getting people to open up. And, you know, like you said, it might captivate an entire family, an entire generation may be moved by hearing those stories. Exactly. And, and here too, though you're, you said great grandfather yes. passed away. Um, if you guys have copies and the family has copies of some of his discharge paperwork, maybe a DD-214 or, or, or uh, equivalent paperwork from his discharge, we can re help you read that like a book. And we can walk through where his unit was, when, and we can re start rebuilding some of that history. We may be able to put you into books that even mention your grandfather, your great grandfather and things like that. So. Um, those type of things, uh, we've got a historian, uh, a staff at the museum that is excellent at digging up those facts. And so even if those veterans aren't around anymore, we can still find the, the essence of their story. That's incredible. I do know my aunt Diane. I'm going to reach out to her after this podcast. I know that she still had like pictures of him from this time in the service and, you know, way back. And she actually, I think, has a lot of like the hand me downs from the family. She might be able to go through her attic and be like, oh, yeah, your great grandfather, you know, left all of these things from his time in the service. So even just sitting down and having this conversation, it's got my wheels turning to like, man, what could be uncovered? You right. know, because he never talked to me about it, but I was very, very young. You know what I mean? All I remember my great grandfather is when I went over to visit at his house. He had a chair that he was always sitting in. He was rocking and um, we would throw little paper airplanes around. He would lightly talk about the war and that was about it, you know, and this could like uncover chapters of his life that I never read. It would be incredible. And I bet you how many people are listening to this podcast. You need to think about the members of your family that had, you know, military service or that are just moved by stories like this. And you need to reach out to the Michigan Heroes Museum and you need to go check this place out. And we need to do a little bit of digging with a research team and just, you know, really captivate people because stories of perseverance, you know, stories of heroism, things like this in society can move us all and it can move the needle in a good direction. And the year 2020 has been so much chaos and division and madness and stress. We need more feel good, you know, um, life can be okay things. You know what I mean? So Right, exactly. What has 2020 been like for you at the museum? Did it really not affect you guys at all? Was it very difficult? What has this year been like? So it affected our fundraising efforts immensely. Um, you know, every year uh, the museum 
takes approximately $120,000 in operating costs, so about $10,000 a month. And we lost out on fundraising opportunities this this year that last summer and fall brought us over $80,000, right? So we're we're struggling right now, but we're going to figure it out. We're, we've been there in Frankenmuth for 43 years now, and we're going to stay there. And so we're going to figure it out with great board members like Josh Parrish and uh, the the whole crew. We just, we're not going to give up and, and, and uh, um, close the place for sure. We just, we're going to figure it out and we're going to move forward, so. Maybe Parrish and I can design some type of thing where we have a bunch of fighters that fight on ESPN, fight on UFC all over the world here. Maybe we could hold like a uh, like a seminar with some of these best people in the world here at the building where we would make it free and open to anyone that with prior military service, anybody, and we could accept donations and 100% of what comes in could get donated to the museum. I feel like we could generate, you know, 100, maybe 200 people. And if everybody chips in a little bit, it can add up really, really quick. Exactly. No, that, that'd that be great. Thank you for even thinking about it. That's, that's amazing. I mean, this, this podcast today has already been incredibly enjoyable. So let's, uh, let's have one more good story that you feel kind of resonates with you about a, you know, a Michigan veteran, anything you want, it can be a medal of honor. It can be a, a story that you recently put out that you're moved by. It can be one of the way back in the day stories that your historians had to dig into. Really, let's just capture one more and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap this podcast up. Sure. So I, I teased earlier, a, um, a story of a medal of honor recipient that I was going to tell by the end. And that's, that's a story of Harold Furlong. He ended up a Colonel, but when in world war one, he was a first Lieutenant and he's on a battlefield and they're in in battle with an entrenched german enemy yeah right and the uh german trench had um four or five maxim machine guns uh at nests built into the top of that and uh, he um his captain his immediate um uh, his immediate commander fell in battle and he had to assume command and he got the, in a hold of the grenadier and he said, I need you to take the satchel of grenades and go up there as close to that, that trench line as you can and start uh, trying to take out those, um, those positions, those machine gun nests and, or get them to um, uh, retreat back into the trench. And so he does that. He gets up there, he starts throwing those, those grenades and Harold watches as those four, uh, machine gunners all jumped down into the trench and as soon as they did that this trench was over a hundred yards away so over a football field away he got up and he ran and he ran around the back side of the the trench and there he slid and he waited he waited for those grenades to stop going off and he watched as those you know uh, machine gunners clamored back into their nest because they wanted to get up there as soon as they could to keep the Americans from advancing, not realizing that one of them had snuck around behind them. They didn't even bother looking behind them because they, you know, didn't occur to them. Um, they start firing again on his men and they're making so much noise and, and their attention's elsewhere that they don't even realize as Harold stands up and, and w- walks uh, towards the edge of the trench and he eliminates those four positions, those four machine gunners. And um, then he uh, takes his rifle and he points it down the the trench and he takes 20 more German prisoners. Um, And it's just a a fascinating, right? Well, he received the Medal of Honor for that. And then he went from being an infantry, he ends up switching it changed his whole life, the taking those four lives and, and what he did there that day in, in service to his country and his fellow man, right? Um, a lot of times when people sign up for service, they do it for their community. They do it for love of country. They do it for a lot of noble or um, uh, motives, right? But their motives in that moment is to save their brothers and their buddies in the arms, right? And and that's what they're going to do. And that's what he did. He, he put it all on the line to help out his men. Um, but he came back to the United States, Pontiac, Michigan. He becomes a doctor, not just any doctor. He became an OBGYN and he delivered over a thousand babies in his lifetime. And, um, when, 
he brought his things to the museum. Uh, he also sent a letter to the Michigan Medal of Honor Society, who had all the guys from World War II, Korea, Vietnam in there. And uh, he sent a letter out to all those individuals and the families of those individuals. And he said, um, I don't know about you, but I believe this museum is going to tell my story the way that I would tell it in a, you know, years to come. And within 90 days, we received most of those stories or we got letters of, of uh, support saying that they would bring those items uh, to Frank Camuth at, at another time. And now we've got the largest collection of name medals of honor anywhere in the world on public display just because this man was, you know, uh, not only did he do a heroic thing, he um, he was a leader. He inspired uh, other people. These guys all looked up, up to him like a father or a grandfather. And, you know, when he said, they're going to tell my story the way that I, I would tell it, he didn't want to be remembered as being a warrior. He wanted to be remembered as a, a, as a doctor, as, a, as a, somebody that healed people and everything. And so when he... Um, when we tell his story, we always make sure people know that he wanted to be remembered for bringing life into the world and not taking it out. That's exactly what he asked, and that's exactly what we do. Um, you know, we ask our our warriors, our our veterans, and our current active military to potentially do some amazing uh, things and some things that. Um, you and I may not be able to do right, and 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 things that it may be um, scar them for life. And what we don't do is, as a society, we don't appreciate that, right? When they come home, we uh, uh, ask, uh, "Hey, why why haven't you taken out the trash? Why why can't you operate uh, like you did before you left, right? Why?" Um, you know, whether it's a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or a dad or a mom, um, we expect the exact same thing to come back as what left us, right? And we don't understand that there are changes, there are chemical changes in the brain and, and, and changes to the soul and spirit of these, these fighting men and women. And uh, we need to recognize that and we need to better as a society um, prepare for um, our receiving them into our lives. You know, it's not their problem. It's our problem, right? And, and it's not that they have a problem. Their problem is that we don't get it, right? It's, I think it's less to do with them. You know, in, in uh, World War I, they called it shell shock. In World War II, they call it battle fatigue. And uh, more currently, we're referring to it as PTSD. Um, but I would stress that we don't call it post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not a disorder. It's something that I don't care who you put in that situation. Um, they've got a great chance of, of being affected for the rest of their life. So the state of Michigan and 19 states have uh, adopted um, the terminology post-traumatic stress injury because it's something that's inflicted on these men and women. And, and I would advocate that we refer to it as that and it is an injury it's nothing uh, that's wrong with that individual it's something that was inflicted upon them so i think if as a society we can learn to understand our veterans more um and at the museum we try to help people understand our, our veterans more but as a society if we do more learning about them and caring about them i i think that's what a what a great world that'll be I think I couldn't have said it any better. It was absolutely beautiful the way that you just phrased that because like you said, it's it's a level of trauma and stress and loss of identity and many other things that most people just wouldn't understand. You, Your life basically completely shifts when you go in and then your life completely shifts when you leave. And those are extreme ups and downs on a chart, you know what I mean? And on top of that, the things that you may have witnessed, the things that you may have lived through, you know, the environments that you've experienced that most people would never understand. And you've created an entire new brotherhood, a new family to only then have that family ripped from you. You know, look at how most people go through a breakup and they're devastated. Imagine the fact that your entire existence, your entire life, your support unit, the people around you, the people you confide in, 
they're now gone. It is a traumatic event. And if you don't have a smooth process or people that love and care about you when you return, it's going to be extremely difficult. So we do need to normalize these conversations of what can we do better and how can we make sure we don't tell someone you have a disorder now because that's, that's like a permanent disability. You've gone through something difficult, but there's absolutely a way to heal. There's a way to recover. There's a way to have a brighter future, but we have to have better pathways for that to take place. And hopefully that's where companies like VetLife and people like yourself and the museum and other things can make veterans realize there is a light at the end of the tunnel, you know, because it probably does feel like a lot of darkness when you first return. You know what I mean? There's so much at once. You're going through a transition period. You just dealt with all this extreme stress. Nobody really understands unless they were over there with you. But now all the people that understand are scattered across the country and you're probably not going to have them in your life frequently. Exactly. It's, it's difficult, man. Yeah. I, I think that um, uh, our veteran service organization, some better than others, vet life among the top in the area, um, I, I think that they can – uh, go a long way to helping these individuals, but it also comes to the veterans realizing that the help is there and asking for it, right? Because um, people like Josh and, and others, they can offer it all day long, but until somebody um, opens their heart and says, hey, you know what, um, I, I'm a strong individual, but I can be stronger with the right assistance and everything, um, you know, the, some of these guys have gotten, and guys and girls have gotten burned by other organizations or, or other promises and everything. Um, but I guarantee you, Josh and Bet Life, and there's other really good organizations out there too that th they're not going to let you down. They're going to take care of you and, and they're going to find you um, what it is that you need to succeed in life. So, man, if you're listening to this podcast, you were inspired by these stories, you value our military, you know people that have you know, gone through exactly what we're discussing right now, reach out, reach out to the gentleman sitting across me from me today, John Ryder, reach out to Josh Parrish, reach out to Vet Life. just reach out to somebody and know that there are people that'll be there for you that they can help make this a little bit better. So John, just uh, any last thing that you want to capture in this glimpse in time, anything you'd like to record on the podcast, you know, it, it, just anything you want to capture and then we'll wrap this up. Yeah, sure. So the museum's open in Frankenmuth there at 1250 Y Street from 10 to 5 every day of the week. Um, we're there uh, so that way you can learn this history, this rich history, military history of individuals who serve from uh, the state of Michigan. And again, we don't care if they were a clerk typist or a, a nurse or frontline combat or a pilot or whatever. If they served, we're going to tell their story in, and we're going to tell it in a compelling way. And we're going to let you know what they did to secure liberty and freedom, not only for us, but around the world. Well, I love it, man. The largest public collection of medals of honor or medals. Yep. Right? Medals of honor. Yeah. Medals of honor in the world yep. here in Frankenmuth, Michigan. So if that doesn't captivate you and compel you to go check out the museum, nothing will. Medal of honor is a terminology that, like I said, everybody is aware of, you know, everybody can appreciate that level of honor and service. So man, awesome podcast today. Thank you for joining me and uh, we'll wrap this thing up. Thank you.